already seen the initials of all Chinese so, uh, uh, but today we're going to come at it from the perspective of the internal reconstruction of middle Chinese and you know if middle Chinese comes from all Chinese then we would expect the internal reconstruction of middle Chinese to be somehow compatible with uh, the proposals that we had come up with for other reasons so here we go so how do we get our initials of all Chinese well through the internal reconstruction through Shishun evidence, which you've already seen. Uh, so let's look first and foremost at the uh, internal reconstruction. In the slides are also the Shishun stuff, which when I get to it, I'll just whisk through, right? Because you all know it already. Uh, but it will help you see, uh, let's say, how far we can get. That's how the presentation is organized. How far can we get with internal reconstruction? Uh, and then what further distinctions does the um, do, do the Shishun series uh, give us? Yeah, okay. So we will remove the the real attribute and the palatal apricots and the records of sucks. These are all you know things where where where. You know, we just added the palatal apricots yesterday, right? <laughs> so you're like, why could I remove them? Right? Well, now we're going backwards in time, right? So basically, through internal reconstruction, you can remove these things. That's the idea. This is not the way of for what we're hoping. Yeah, we haven't done this yet because we, because we, we basically, I had been asking, so from the beginning, I had been asking you to just sort of take Middle Chinese as given. Right. Uh, but then I wouldn't want to do internal reconstruction of middle Chinese until you would actually have a good look at middle Chinese and understood how we actually make middle Chinese. Yeah, so I could have done this right at the beginning and just said, like, well, take middle Chinese as given as some sort of uh, language attested in Roman script, right? And then we could internally reconstruct it. But I somehow feels more ethical to um, say, you know, now, uh, following on yesterday, you know what's going on in middle Chinese. So now you can uh, use Middle Chinese more uh, comprehensively with, with greater confidence uh, to reconstruct Old Chinese. Okay? And then what I'm going to add, we're going to add labial healers, which are the, the main thing that we haven't discussed yet, because you can't really get them, I don't think, just based on Shishun series. Okay. So uh, first of all, the origin of the, oh, did I, did I mess this all up? Yes, I have. It should have the circle here. This is this is, yeah. You know, this is the problem. I had all these powerpoints in back to back to nineteen nineteen, and I've tried to switch it in the line, uh, but uh, not perfectly. So, so yeah, so we're getting rid of actually the voice wheeler for it, which makes better sense. Um, so you see this complement distribution between type A and type B syllables, where, and I did cover this yesterday, right? Where we have the voice field of figure only in type A syllables and the uh, G only in type B syllables. I'm leaving aside the scuffing of uh, this initial, right? Which we talked about yesterday. So forget about him. We're only talking about these ones, which the rhyme fables all be okay. So, anyhow. So, Carl Brain suggested. Uh, that G change to the in type A syllables. Of course, he didn't call them type A syllables. Uh, I feel like actually Carver in, in, in my description doesn't come up very often. Yeah. So um, I think that's because a lot has happened since he was working in the 20s and 30s. But uh, here's one. So uh, so that's that. So we've gotten rid of uh, the voice field fricative by expanding the distribution of the G. All right, and then the origin of the final advocates, we've actually been through this one before uh, from the perspective of Shishun series. Uh, but uh, now, you know, it's the same thing, but from the perspective of internal reconstruction. So dentals and kind of proper dentals only occur in type A syllables. And the, where, there, and there we go. And then the palatal advocates. Only occur in type B syllables. So 
why don't we just say that uh, the palatal apertures come from dentals? Yeah, so, so you saw this one, we did this before based on the fact that Chaitron series mixed them. Uh, but you can just do it from a complementary distribution inside a uh, new Chinese without looking at changes. All right. And then uh, looking at laterals and red reflex constants. So these two vowels, which we can call a and a, which are only occur in division two, uh, which you can understand as meaning. Rank two for now. Uh, only occur with dental initial. So we have maybe I'll write this down. We have things like this in the chain, and we have things like this. And then I'll just say if we want to imagine this looks like yeah, this one's this one and this one. That's actually how that, that Baxter writes them in the 1992 book. It is 1992. So he so Baxter wanted his middle Chinese to be totally typable, yeah, which is say only use uh, uh ASCII characters with no diacritics. But his publisher, Wuton de Reuter, said, No, this is a linguistics book. Please use <laughs> uh, these. So so in the 1992, you'll see these, uh, but later he writes them. So uh, and then only very rarely. And love occur with these, yeah, which is to say, like um, something like this, not doesn't really occur, uh, it occurs very, very rarely. And actually, maybe the most uh, common word is the Lu in An Lu Shan, you know, like the An Lu Shan rebellion. Come on, someone, you know. Say, oh yeah, the on the shot belly. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, now I feel like I need to tell you about the on the shot belly. There was there was a guy on the shot who was sick of uh, living under the yoke of the emperor uh, in the in the sort of well in the middle of the Tang, and so he led a rebellion, and it it, it was quite successful. Really uh, shook the Tang. Really, like like the Tang receded. Out of Central Asia, uh, they they stopped being a kind of international player basically for a while, and then uh, on Lushan, this is his name, right? Um, so on we now know means I think Parthian, right? I think that's what we said. Anyhow, it's uh, some kind of Central Asian, uh, and then uh, argued by Beckwith, although I think. It's widely agreed. This is um, like cognate with Roxanne. So he was probably a Sogdian in any case. Um, but anyhow, the, the, the Lu here uh, is basically the only uh, division two line Lu initial. Yeah. Uh, and you know, probably not a coincidence that it's writing something foreign and quite late. Yeah. Okay. So these vowels are, are uh, this is using Baxter system. So I write this with the schwa side of it. Uh, I didn't realize, you know, I looked at it this morning actually and said, oh, yeah, it was good. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, U and E, so that's division one slash four, uh, don't occur with red reflex songs. So what does that mean? That means we don't have things like, uh, this or this, you know, say on this. Okay. So these are just, you know, this is the early reconstruction. So these are facts about the, the opponent tactics of middle training. So Yachenkopf um, proposed that the dental and retroflex initials have the same origin. And basically, what you can say is that, uh, well, that these vowels come from some kind of R coloring. These, these don't occur. Is that 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so where's the plan Yeah, so what we propose then is that um, in general, the vowels, let's take a, a case where they do occur, something like uh, am and pun. Oops, all the words right away. So we say these vowels are are colored versions of maybe these vowels, yeah, or who knows, right? Well, well, well um, but some some vowel, and let's just say this one's from R, R, and we'll say this one's from R. Yeah. Um, so the R in some environments causes the the R coloring of the vowel, but then in other environments, uh, like uh, here, goes back to the right? So basically, the R either changes the initial into a retroflex or it changes the color of the vowel. Could have done both, but in case. Yeah. Uh, and then we also. We take the L back to an R, uh, and that explains why uh, why we don't have things like this because that would have to go back to right? which kind of doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, so that explains why we don't. Oops, I'll, I'll use this to not test it, right? Uh, and then this one to mean the So that so this R proposal, which actually this. All of this stuff, uh, Baxter calls the R hypothesis, which is to say, R, so L comes from R, Middle Chinese L comes from Old Chinese R, and then Old Chinese R on its way to Middle Chinese either changes them into the retroflexes or it changes the color of the neighboring vowel. And there's not a dental around. Okay. So that's that. Okay, so now. The labial velars. So middle Chinese syllables with W, which are Oko, we heard about just today, fall neatly into two categories. So one is check lines that occur only after velars or levels. So these rhymes, yeah. So what am I saying? I'm saying that we have syllables like like yeah, but we don't have syllables like twin. Okay, I'll try that. Uh, yeah, this is the same time. These are these are things that don't have. Uh, and then other rhymes like win, one, that's uh, go with anyone. Yeah, so we have quid, and we also have twin. Yeah, so uh, let's just say there are two kinds of rhymes in the way of think about it, right? We have the the what's called the velar happy rhymes, and the don't care rhymes. Uh, so let's just, you know, in a totally mechanical way, in the first instance, uh, reconstruct one as W1. So we'll call these this one W1. We'll call this one W2. So W1 only protects the dealers and models, uh, but with any rhyme. And W2 only in certain rhymes. I think I've made a little bit of a sleight of hand there, right? Which is to say, like, if so, so these are the don't care rhymes, 
and these are the Beeler happy runs. So another way you can do that is to say W1 can occur anywhere, and W2 can only occur with these runs. Does that make sense? Right. Which means that if you like, Quinn has two sources. Uh, Quinn in Middle Chinese could come from Quinn with, with W1 or Quinn with W2. Yep. But when can only come from this one, from when you want. Okay. I'm, this is maybe more steps in internal reconstruction than you need, because you probably are already, from the fact that this section is called Old Chinese Labor Healer, you anticipated where the argument is going, right? So let's just. Do that. So, only four uh, is, and he doesn't usually, I don't think he usually gets the credit for this. I forget who does. I think it's Yakupov again. Um, but anyhow, yeah, only four uh, proposed that uh, this W1, uh, you know, V or plus W1 uh, goes back to a lake. So, then we get things like this. So, uh, Kwan comes from Kwan and Kwan comes from Kwan, etc. And then for the moment, and this is just for me to point it out, because otherwise you might, uh, we have to also reconstruct monsters like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that's just because we're only taking the perspective at the moment of internal reconstruction, right? In fact, you already know that I'm going to take it back to Euclid. So that, that in all Chinese, we'll, we'll only reconstruct uh, labial uvulars and labial velars, which makes good sense. And actually, I would say in a way that um, this is an argument for reconstructing uvulars, you know, fr from the perspective of internal reconstruction, which is to say, uh, although we, although I don't think internal reconstruction gives us grounds to uh, reconstruct the uvulars, if we allow ourselves to reconstruct the uvulars, it makes this look much less crazy. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I just want to say that's where we are with internal reconstruction. We have uh, we have lego velars and lego glottals. Okay. So now this is our provisional inventory of old Chinese initials. So uh, basically, what I did was just take the middle Chinese initials, and then I got rid of the palatals, and I added labial feelers, right? Uh, and then uh, you see this nice, this nice, this is the U, yeah, which I just put there because I haven't done anything with it. That's this one. Right? This one we we'll talked about yesterday. So, uh, so we have the. Uh, we have, yeah, it's right now. Yeah, this is what we got. Okay, so, uh, and then this is type in type A syllable, which is the same. Edit. That was it, basically. That was what, you know, the, that was the thing that I really wanted to do was the uh, internal reconstruction of middle Chinese. Uh, but now, that were this that were here. Let's kind of do what we did before, uh, where we add more uh, initials using the Sheshan hypothesis. Okay. Okay. So remember our laterals, and then what's this resonance? Six laterals. Okay, so we've seen all this here. You know, just remind ourselves. Basically, you know the the nasals turn into ha, and then the or no the graves that's the turn into ha, and then the juice turn into ha, and then over here uh uh and sha and then ha for this this. Weird 
uh, outcome there. Uh, okay, and then the uvula. So now we can get back to the fix the problem with the globules. Uh, and we've seen all this before. So, oh, oops, I went too fast. Uh, yeah, so, right? So this is our sort of, these are the things we're used to by now, I think. Well, the stock goes back to uvular, H goes back to uh, work. So, yeah, this is where I believe it. That's a, uh, uh, I have a thing on here. So, um, so yeah, the the voiceless VL fricative goes back to the QH, and the voiceless fricative goes back to the to the G, uh, and then uh, in these labial VLR types, uh, or high front vowels also yeah. Okay. Uh, now this is the new part. Does old Chinese have a Y? Yeah. So uh, we so far, we should say yeah, we so far have said that, uh, let's say that, that ga is one source of Y. In, uh, I think it's right in Chinese syllables. Uh, and actually, I mean, yeah, all, all initial yas of middle Chinese are in type B syllables, right? This is kind of by definition. So, so we, so this works for us. Um, but uh, some people are not happy to just say, okay, then whenever you see a ya in middle Chinese, uh, take it back to a, a uvular. So these are, yeah, these are the sort of, oh, right, yeah. I should have just waited for this slide. So these are the sources that we, we have. That's one that I that I'm in here. But we also have this and L as sources for Ya. So there's three sources for Ya. So uh, so Bachelor Dugar think that's enough. We can get rid of all the Yas. Uh, but Axel Schuttler and Guillaume Jacques don't think so. They think we need some kind of primary Yas. And this is their uh, evidence for that. So I'll just go through that here. This is the word for sheep, yang, right? So back into Dugar will take it back to it. Um, uh, but it has a uh, Tibetan cognate, uh, yang kar, where kar means white. Yeah? Uh, so it's some kind of white sheep. And this G, I mean, my, this is where, like, look, it depends on what, what, what you think. Maybe this G goes back to the uvula, right? But no, 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 no. People, people like to ignore prefixes. But, so uh, the, the ya makes you think, nah, and maybe it goes back to ya. But in any case, whatever you think of the Tibetan, this uh, Gyalong, uh, which also has a few real about, you know, uh, <laughs> as a Yu in, in, in kind of pre Gyalong, and I don't know how to get pre Gyalong, I just mm -hmm. let Yong Chak do it for me. But, you know, Yu goes to this Ja, it's no surprise. So, anyhow, to make it a concrete claim, both Axel Trisler and Yong Jak point to the Yu here and here as evidence that this probably should be a Yu there. Yeah, and to take another one, uh, this itch word. Uh, ah, see here we don't get a uvular in, in Java. So we have itch in Chinese, which is yang, and then we have yao. Okay, this uh, finally is getting with irregular here. So maybe you can just say they're not cognate. Yeah. So we should say the real answer to the problem. But whatever, I'm not trying to convince you that these targets are real. I'm just trying to communicate to you that Yong Jack and Michael Chrysler think they're real. Uh, and um, but, uh, yeah, the ones couldn't it correspond to some kind of uh, more normal ones in the right? So, I mean, you have to do an angel, but there's also something after that. Are you talking about these? About this uh, problem? Oh, 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 so this in, so this, now we're talking about Tibetan here, right? So this symbol in Tibetan, I think, was a voice real fricative, which is also why I use it when to write a voice real fricative in Chinese. Uh, but it would have, it would have, the voicing wouldn't have been phonemic uh, in this syllable position. So how would, how would I uh, do this? I would reconstruct it as yah, something like that. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah. So so, uh, but uh, but most people think that uh, this does, is just some kind of orthographic device. Uh, actually, I'm gonna. I, I, I want to make the case for them thinking it's some kind of orthographic device, but I can't because I don't believe it. <laughs> uh, in some cases, I'll give you one, uh, like this is a verb to exist. Uh, and so if it's good, stop, something like that. Uh, but if you didn't have this here, you would read this because Tibetan doesn't write the initial A, ah, you would read it as God. So because of cases like this, people think it's a purely orthographic device. Uh, but actually here, even if you didn't have it there, it would be totally clear how to read that. So that's one reason I think, you know, um, the, the way I would put it, but I, this is, you know, it's not a Tibetan class. But the way I would put it is probably at some point in some kinds of places, they use this, this final A uh, as an orthographic device, uh, pointing out that the vowel is an A, uh, but they do that because it becomes possible to do that because it's lost. It's not something that they kind of came up with as an orthographic proposal at Snehilo. And cases like this show you that because here it would be totally unambiguous either way. So anyhow, uh, all of that's just to say, do, do, are you comfortable with, you know, like, yeah, okay. Oh, oh yours, that's what you're saying. This law stop here, right? So maybe, yeah. Yeah, I see a kind of mismatch with the given that so there's more in push than this. Yeah. yeah. So so maybe this call stop is somehow a cock name with this, you know, voiceless feel of or voice feel of maybe phonemically. Uh, who knows? But these the 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 Auslaut correspondences between uh sign of Tibetan languages are a mess. Uh, although they're not as much of a mess as the initial correspondences. <laughs> uh, and if you want, I, I go through in my 2019 book and just present them all, just like to say, okay, here's, you know, here's not a correspondent, and here's where it's a mess and whatnot. So, um, you know, it's, I'm in the hopes that, you know, I mean, now, now I tell this um, story, right? Uh, I can never remember the guy's name, maybe Cole Lockenmore or something, but. There was someone who uh, assembled all of the exceptions to Grimm's law. And it, you know, it's a sort of paper that would be very hard to publish now. But they'd say, I don't have any proposal. I don't have any argument. Uh, here's just some well-organized data. Uh, but then Werner picked it up and was like, ah, I know this. Yeah. Um, so I'm sort of hoping that you know, people will do that with this section of my book. They'll just say, that, oh, it's clear that he just miss missed this obvious conditioning environment. Uh, but and it, hasn't, it hasn't happened so far. Um, but anyhow, yeah. the point here is just uh, I, I do think this reflects the state of the art in the sense that I don't think that Young got or Axel Schiffer proposing these as cognates is at all a bad idea. And we, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, we don't have any reason to think they can't be cognates. Maybe that's a good way of putting it. I might suggest to them that there are some, if you like, using the sort of traditional uh, sinological terminology, there are primary yodes in uh, sign of Tibetan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I already covered. Oh, this is the ticket for lane yode. And quick question is the uh, reason why we don't want to reconstruct the other goal because eventually it points that there's no initial W. Well, that that. So, uh, the so the structural reason why we don't want to go is just the best thing. Here's what I'll say: It's like I don't think it's coincidence that Axel Schuffler wants her to be both initial W and an initial Y, whereas Baxter and Cigar wants her not to be an initial W or an initial Y, right? Uh, and and both of those are kind of um, intuitions about elegance, right? And I think the Let's let me sort of say what the intuition about elegance is from Baxter's cigar side, which is if they have enough machinery to get them everything they need to get, then they shouldn't add any more machinery, right? Uh, and actually, I would say that generally speaking, people criticize them for having too much machinery, right? So, so here's a moment where they're showing restraint. We do not allow ourselves initial young. 
So um, I think that can only be applauded. Uh, but what Baxter, sorry, what um, what Schuffler says, I mean, uh, this is maybe being unfair to him, is like uvulars. What kind of language has uvulars? Yeah. Um, and that's a lot of a lot of people have that reaction. Uh, I think because uh, you know, if you look in Southeast Asia, if you look in among Chinese dialects, you know, there aren't any uvulars. Yeah. So, so if you are trained in kind of East Asian studies uh, and you only speak European languages other than East Asian languages, you know, it will seem typologically aberrant to propose uvulars. But of course, Sichuan is full of uvulars, as is Central Asia, right? So I don't think that I don't think that kind of uvular phobia is a good reason to to not reconstruct uvulars. Yeah, and then I'll also say that. Um, I'll, at least on this score, let me put it this way. Uh, bathroom cigar have the right amount of machinery, right? They, they're able to explain all the Shishun series, and they don't pro propose uh, an initial ya, which they don't need. Whereas uh, Schussler proposes the initial ya, and he doesn't propose any of the uvulars, which means all kinds of Shishun series don't work for him. Yeah? And then what does he say about that? He says, look, the Shishan series, uh, the Shishan hypothesis should be taken with a grain of salt. Don't push it, you know, to the limit every time, right? Uh, and I guess even I said that with this Nook example that you remember from a long time ago now, uh, but um, which is that, you know, if, if we need to add uh, 10 vowels or, you know, hundreds of initial consonants uh, in order to make the Shishan hypothesis work, then we probably shouldn't. And different people have different intuitions about it. How far to push the Shishun hypothesis, uh, but then you know I've been making the case that uh, in general I think you should push hypotheses until they become absurd, right? Um, because it's only then that you learn where that kind of you know where where well where where reality is if you sort of overshoot it and then backtrack, right? Um, but anyhow, so that was you know now I've just flagged for you that that, that whether or not there's an initial ya is uh, controversial. Uh, but the main reason that it's proposed uh, is, or maybe let's say there are two reasons. Uh, one is to make uh, comparisons look better, which is kind of a bad reason. Yeah. Uh, or uh, because people feel like it makes the language look nicer, which is also kind of a bad reason. Although I will say, if we if we had overwhelming evidence that Simon Tibetan had a yeah, in the, you know, in the, in the word for um, sheep, let's say. If we, look, if we had Burmese and Tibetan and, you know, Kiranti and whatnot, uh, and then it went to uh, <laughs> this in Chinese in order to then become Yang again. Well, of course, that would not be very elegant. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that reconstructing Ya in Proto-Sign Tibetan, I'll say, from the Proto-Sign Tibetan, all Chinese, middle Chinese. You know, I'll say, if it were the case that this was you know, really solid is young in Protestant Tibet. And then I would agree with Schussler and uh, and uh, Young Jock, but at the moment, I don't think it's, you know, I think that why don't we just say that the young in Yarong and in um, and in Tibetan comes from a voice uvular stop. That's still not the best of the science uh, of Yarong. Oh, come on. Yeah, it's not. I mean, you can do nice and fast when you call it with or something like that. Only in type B syllables, right? So, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, then propose something else yeah. if you don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I don't know. I would go for what I guess. Well, I think, I mean, we, we went through this before, but I think it would have gone through this stage, right? Please, and, please. And, and maybe that's as far back as we should push it. I was actually thinking to myself, because of conversations with you, why don't we just reconstruct them as frickin' is? Yeah. Well, it's because of the glottal stop. Yeah, but I would I would then say the aspirated con yeah. is the is the, the glot is the blood, and the glot stop is just the That's my Oh yeah, okay, maybe. Uh, and then you just say glot stop and uvular are close enough in terms of their position of articulation to be allowed inside a Shishan series. Uh, uh, also, linguistically, they, they are often quite less. Maybe not kind of. 
Yeah, yeah, they don't necessarily mean spots. They are very often conflict rates. Yeah, especially the plan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I I mean I'm dry at the it's the part of the yeah. they they like to African, so you uh, well I don't I, I leave this to the you know the, the kind of uvular uvularologist. <laughs> yeah. Um but I but I think it doesn't look bad, you know. And well and I would also say, let's say from Baxter Cigars uh, perspective, if I propose, you know, uh if I propose this one and uh and uh yeah. And what's it? What's the one I just did? Yeah, this one, and a lot of stuff. Then why not make the Shashan's hypothesis, you know, work by by taking it back to to this? Yeah, yeah. both assumptions. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, I think they would admit that the 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 uvular hypothesis is a weak point of their reconstruction. Especially because in their reconstruction, then you also have pharyngealized and unpharyngealized uvulas, right? That's not, which is that we need some other source for these things ultimately. Um, but, you know. Well, I guess it's a bit worrying if you have uvulas and regularized uvulas and pharyngealized uvulas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree with that. But so, I mean, and I think, I don't know if I've done this in class or just talking to some of you, but. Here's how, here's, here's what, what I think the best case is. Yeah, let's just do this. Okay, so uh, let's do it backwards in time, yeah? So, so in Middle Chinese, we have uh, Yeah. Okay, this is no chance, right? Okay, now, oh, except we don't have this one. Yeah. This is type A, this is type B. Okay, so, so we're going to move this one up here. Yeah. And then we have this. Yeah, so that was, that was totally sleight of hand. Uh, but, but I need it in order to say these two are all kinds of distribution. Right? So then I go back to sort of, to, to, let's call it late old Chinese. Uh, and then uh, in late old Chinese, I would have uh, a G and a G and a K and a K. And a either fricative. Oh, and then also we have, you know, we have pho and pho. so, and then I would also have pho. Uh, okay. So uh, then in, uh, let, uh, let's say in middle. <laughs> like old Chinese, yeah. We know from loan words into Hmong Yan that the type A uh, velars were uvulars, right? So actually, this was uh, and this, right? Okay. So, um, I mean, I should have actually, yeah, I'll do it. Why not? Okay, I'll have to write small one in the middle. We have late, late old Chinese. And uh, remind me what I just wrote. <laughs> uh, G, and then I'll, I'll say, I'll have the B type B as power. Yeah. Uh, so G and G, K and K, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, something like this. No? That's late old Chinese. And then middle old Chinese. We would have uh, uh, oops, this one could be a And then probably these were velars, right? Uh,
and then I don't know, maybe this, maybe this was, maybe, maybe this, maybe that this was also dealer and like me, who knows? Yeah, doesn't even matter. Perfect. I'll, I'll draw some lines here so that we know where we are. Okay. So at this point, what we have are stops and uh, fricatives in both uh, uvular and uh, velar, right? Uh, but then when we go back to old, old Chinese, then we, uh, we would say that they are just, again, G and G, K and K. And then now we would add the capital G for this one, and then a P, O, M, and I. The whole time I've been forgetting that well stop. So we get well stop, we get well stop, we get well stop. And then here I would make a well stop for Q, right? So um, at this moment, I think it's fine to say that type A was pharyngealized, right? In middle old Chinese. But in old old Chinese, it has to be something else. And that's what I think, yeah, what you were saying is like, is, is we, we don't want uvulars that can be labialized or pharyngealized. Yeah. Uh, where we would have sort of, we would have, you know, uh, this looks like too much. And I agree with that. Yeah. I would basically say that we should, in principle, reconstruct what we need. So if we need something strange, we should reconstruct it, but we, it's becoming gradually more alarming. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but so I'll say, like, um, some big event happened, uh, which uh, actually this guy, who I saw calls the Great Vowel Ship, uh, which, which happened in sort of the, 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 the kind of well, maybe you'd say the early on. Okay, and it really, you know, in some ways resembles the Great Vowel Shift of English, which is why he calls it that. Yeah. Uh, so in the Great Vowel Shift, the uh, the 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 vowels moved. They moved backwards in type A syllables and forwards in type B syllables. So then the like in, in the 1992 book, Baxter takes type B all the way back as a medial J. So he, he, he kind of does this one, yeah? Uh, but that's also ugly in its own way, because you end up with like half the syllables in the language with a medial J in them, and then there's no evidence for it from early Indian transcriptions. It doesn't come up in cognates. So, so basically, when he abandoned the type B is middle, is, is, is a medial ya, then he turned to type A is a pharyngealized uh, onset, right? And uh, the person who first proposed this pharyngealization hypothesis was uh, Norman, Jerry Norman. Uh, and, and it's nice, right? Because it explains why the vowels sort of front with pharyngealization and no, back with pharyngealization and front without, uh, which also would explain why you know, basically to maintain the contrast, uh, you add these paddles and whatnot. Uh, and then also it makes sense of why the in loans to Feng Yen, you end up with, um, with uh, uh, velars uh, borrowed as uvulars. So I think the pharyngealization hypothesis is nice, but the evidence for the pharyngeal pharyngealization hypothesis, let's say begins in the Han, which is when you get loans into uh, other languages and uh, and when you have the great vowel shift and ends uh, in terms of the a b distinction ultimately coming from the rhyme tables ends in the song right so our kind of the evidence for whatever type a b was goes from sort of 200 to 1200 if you like yeah whereas the evidence for these uvulars comes from the structure of the characters themselves, which presumably are much older, like, uh, let, let's not go 1200 BC, but like, I don't know, 500 BC, 800 BC, something like that. So I think the best way to do this is to just say, 
I don't know what the type A, type B syllable were up here. It's something that can become pharyngealization is what type A was. And something that does not become pharyngealization <laughs> is what type B was. Uh, and the best thing to do is to look at cognates in other languages, right? So, um, uh, Cigar thinks that, uh, that uh, you had something like, uh, like, well, I'll just erase all this now. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so, so the Kuki Chin languages are languages uh, of the sort of uh, west of Burma, east of Manipur, you know, a little bit in Bangladesh, and they have a uh, vowel length distinction. And I don't know, I don't have any cognates in my head. So I'm just gonna make them up, yeah. Um, so Holy Blank suggested uh, that a, a, let me see if I get this right, that, um, yeah, that type A, that all Chinese A corresponds to long vowels in Kuching. And that type B corresponds to short vowels. I think I have that right. Uh, and that, uh, sorry, Cigar likes this idea. Uh, and then what he uh, uh, um, proposes is that actually, which would make sense, that this comes from uh, an inner vocalic consonant, right? So I'll give an example that uh, might work, um, although I'd have to check all the forms. Uh, Cigar thinks that the word for brain in, uh, I think it's STAM, right? So Sino, Tibetan, Austronesian is Punuk. And then uh, it goes into Austronesian as still Punuk, I think. Oops. Uh, like that. Uh, but then in Sino Tibetan, uh, well, no, I'll say in Kuki Chin, uh, it would, I mean, I don't think this form exists, but it would become, you know, Uk, yeah. Uh, and then in Old Chinese, it would become, uh, it would become Nuk type A, yeah. So, that's, I think, his theory. Uh, and he wrote a little article not that long ago, like maybe three, four years ago, uh, where he compares uh, whether or not there are long vowels in Kuki Chin with uh, Old Chinese following up on Polyglot, yeah? But, but he comes up with very few cognates, and there are cognates in both directions. Uh, so then he does, which is which is in style now. Uh, you know, Ben Sukhar did it the other night. He uses Fisher's exact te test, and me, I'm a total you know cretin or troglodyte or something. So I say, the moment you start doing statistics and historical linguistics, my eyes blaze over, and I think, you know, we don't we don't need those fancy tools. And uh, <laughs> and, and if we and, and if someone is tempted to use them, it means their argument isn't very strong. Yeah, um, uh, which is to say, as a neo-grammarian, you know, I want everything to work perfectly every single time. Uh, and we're not to that point with this Kuki Chin hypothesis. Personally, I don't think it's very promising. Like, if I had a PhD to give the also the system some fresh air, and, uh, or something extra on the bottle, just move to the right. Yeah. You like it. You're saying in principle. Yeah. yeah. I also like it in principle. I just don't think it works. Yeah. Which, which is to say, I don't, personally, I don't see a correspondence between uh, long and short vowels in uh, and in Kuki Chin and uh, type A, type B syllables in, um, in uh, Old Chinese. I'll, I'll just mention another one that people have tried to do. Which is Tibetan loves to powerize things, yeah. So, um, well, just take my word for it. <laughs> Tibetan loves to powerize things. So um, we could sort of say all Chinese 
has A, B, where Tibetan has uh, plain and palatalized. Right. So that's another thing that you could you could look at and sort of works. It's I mean I think it's about as good as the Kuki Chin, where you're like you, you you can maybe find more examples going the one way than going the other way, but it's 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 really like oh I found. 17 examples of the correspondence and 15 counterexamples or something like that. So I don't I don't find it very promising. And then I'll just give you a, 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 an example, which is that um, uh, the old Chinese word for fish is na basically, I think in Thai okay. uh, And the Tibetan word for fish is nya, which is palatalized. So you're like, oh, fantastic, it works, yeah. But um, the old Chinese word for uh, I, like me, I, right? I think the, it's this one, right? So it's five over u. I think it's also type B syllable. Uh, and it in, in Tibetan is, it's not unpalatalized. Yeah. So I uh, so for me this this kind of is a good example of like well what are you going to do with that? No. <laughs> uh, whereas if it were if it, if it really were I would want this one to be that yeah. Although now I actually am worried that this one is that way, but um, you know you can always check everything I say. You should check. Right? Uh, okay. Anyhow, uh, that sort of. Uh, is maybe not said about the origin of the type uh, A and B distinction, but I think it's on the right track. What do I even, who, who am I even saying it's on the right track? Uh, the, the, the place to look for cognates of the type A to B distinction in Old Chinese is cognate languages that have some, you know, syllable feature that's in a binary contrast. So palatalized, unpalatalized in Tibetan, short and long vowels in Kuhi Chin, Velarized versus unvelarized uh, in Gyaronic. I think that one's pretty obvious, but but work on Gyaronic, uh, or let's say the expansion of work on Gyaronic studies is uh, recent enough that I don't think comparing you know pharyngealization in Old Chinese with velarization in Gyaronic has really happened yet. Uh, the Gyaronic people tell me that it doesn't look very promising from their perspective, uh, but I think that's you know. It would be nice to study more systematically these kind of, uh, I don't even know what to call them, binary syllable type phenomena in sign of Tibetan languages. Uh, and then one of them is going gonna, is gonna to be cognate with the type AB distinction, right? It just this has to be the case. Yeah. Um, so, anyhow, that's, uh, that's enough about that, about type A and type B. We will even care about cognate syllable structures because we, we know that Mung Yan borrows that as we do that. We know they have vowel. They, yeah. they borrow velars and A syllables as in type A syllable, yeah. And we have vowel automation, so we are pretty sure that A is the, the regionalization for some stage of Chinese. Yeah. So rather look how the regionalized systems. Right, right. Yes, uh, I agree, and I'm going to just repeat for the benefit of those people who are online. Uh, the the suggestion is well, look, we have enough information to know that at some point in the history of Chinese, the type A syllables were pharyngealized, and type B syllables were sort of plain. So then the question is, we also have reason to think that wasn't the original system because we don't want uh, pharyngealized uvulas. So then the question becomes not one for comparative linguistics, but for typological linguistics. Where do pharyngealization contrasts come from yeah, around the world? If we find from the typological literature that there's a particular phenomenon that tends to be what the origin of a pharyngealization contrast is, then yeah, we should just reconstruct whatever that is. Yeah. So kind of pharyngealization of vowels that is um, also different than put as the track to tongue roots. Um, which is a kind of vowel harmony system that you see mostly in North Asia, but also in Africa, in uh, West Africa. So that might be an area to look for this kind of contrast. But do you know of any work on where these things come from? How do you get a vowel of an ATR harmony contrast in your language? Yeah, that's. <laughs> 
So the thing is with, um, at least in Northeast Asia, it's, it's mostly a, a, an aerial feature. So a lot of this language is not that, and you don't really know where it comes from. It's just there. Um, sometimes it's thought to spread from the east to the west. Um, but in that case, it's just, just a lack of documentation. It's probably impossible to really figure out where it comes from. But it might be a bit more easy in um, for West Africa, given that this language is part of larger families. So uh, sometimes the type A syllables have been actually, I think Mark Miyake in a nice presentation that was given to us a long time ago that's now on YouTube. Uh, he compared the emphatic consonants in Semitic with uh, with uh, what's going on in Chinese. And, and his comparison was specifically about what they do to vowels, I think, in, in the Han Dynasty and comparing it to Maltese. Yeah? But um, the problem there is if you ask the, you know, the Semeticists, uh, these emphatic consonants are also ur alt. Yeah? Um, although I think I heard someone saying that, that well, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I shouldn't talk, but I, I think yesterday I heard someone saying that uh, the current consensus is at the earliest stage, they were probably adjectives. Yeah, so, you know, maybe we should reconstruct adjectives. <laughs> that's really very nice parallel because you get these familiar stops to become beautiful, right? So how do you do that? It's not a beautiful, so it's a second year, it's E-mall, I think is what they call them. You can vowel that it comes to that. Yeah, yeah, so, so, it, so, it would be nice. so you agree that it's a it's a good mark was on the right track in terms yeah, of so, the yeah, type of comparison. Yeah, no one knows where everything is, but it's about that you uh, well, I, I, I guess yeah, it's said electives because the other branches have electives. Yeah, that's not yeah, it's, it's not yet available. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so uh, we saw these. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. here are uvulas, changes, there's some type E, uh, okay, so another question to ask ourselves, and this one I'm doing just for the sake of thoroughness, there's no controversy in the discipline about it as far as I know. Is uh, the sources of the uh, velar fricative. So we have these sources. We have the voiceless na, the voiceless ma, and the uvular aspirate stop. So uh, Baxter and Cigar think that's enough. Yeah, you don't. That's uh, enough. So uh, so they don't reconstruct uh, a aha in old Chinese. Uh, and their default, like, so, yeah, their default is the Q8. If there's some morphological or some uh, some Sheshan in particular connection to M or, or not, then they reconstruct it as a voiceless uh, M or not. But uh, uh, if they don't want to do, they take back to like the QH. Okay. And then here are just some, some colors. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, and then the other one that we that we haven't really talked about is uh, so this is just to remind you I still am in some sense internally reconstructing Middle Chinese, right? So first we got to how far we could get with with Middle Chinese, sort of without looking at Shaishan series. Then we add a bunch of other stuff using Shaishan series, and then we see like okay, what's left over in Middle Chinese that we haven't talked about in the, you know. Um, whether or not to get rid of it. So we talked about the ya, where back from cigar get rid of it, and axle trust were in young dark dong. Then we have the ha, which back from cigar get rid of, and I don't think anyone else has really commented on, uh, but let's say they also want to get rid of it, say there, there are enough or in the other. So similar with Z. So um yeah, so Baxter in 1992 just projected it straight back to, to the beginning. Uh, so he thought Old Chinese had a Z. Uh, and then Schutzler allows for Z, uh, but only seems to, this is, uh, he hasn't written about it explicitly, but just looking at the examples in his etymological dictionary, only seems to posit it as a pre initial before. Uh, wa, and remember that in general, his was or Baxter and Cigar's was. So uh, Baxter and Cigar would have, you know, this, and then 
he would have this. Okay. Um, which seems like a, a distribution that would be hard to account for. Uh, and then Bass and Cigar have all kinds of origins of uh, that we've seen before, uh, and they're, they're like an S prefix that voices uh, before voice stuff, but not before names. Remember that in, in like, like sla becomes su and sma becomes su and sna becomes su, but like, I don't know. Uh, actually, I, I think only in some environment, I think in some environments it becomes ga, but in others it would become uh, za and so on. Uh, okay, that, that we covered a couple days ago. We should say the Bachelor's Bar have lots of ways of getting these, so they think that there weren't any of these in old Chinese. So uh, now we look at sort of what we have done. Yeah, so the inventory of old Chinese uh, simplex onsets. Uh, we have added, this is based on the Shakespeare series, we've added the laterals, we've added the voiceless resonance, we've added the uvulars. And then we removed uh, huh and za and possibly also ya. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, this is what we get uh, before type B syllables. And this is what we get for type B syllables. And then I will say. Uh, I think I covered it in another class, but uh, should we get rid of the law of stop, right? Because you could just say all of the law of stop come from Q. And it seems like the main reason they don't do that, the main reason they keep the law of stop is, well, twofold. In, there are a few kind of uvular looking series that are short and don't have the usual uvular stuff like, like, um, like, uh, huh initials in English Chinese. Yeah. So, so if it doesn't have, so if we only have, say, uh, K and Lava Stop, uh, then they will say, well, you know, maybe we should just, uh, no, I don't know, K is not maybe they do it. If we if we just have a series which is just, you know, I don't know, up and ups and whatnot, then they say, okay, let's take it back to Lava Stop. And then we did see that complicated one with the K prefix, which is why I wrote K there, right? Uh, the K prefix before a global stop that they use to uh, propose that you have one syllable type like this and one syllable type like this. We went through that uh, a couple of days ago as well. But, um, but let's say that's this point, which is should we reconstruct a separate um, global stop initial in all Chinese? It's something they've changed their minds about now and then. Yeah, and I think that's, it's, it's like I told you, a few years ago, we got very L happy, like in the early 2000s. So all the Ds were changed to Ls, yeah, uh, basically. And then, um, and then you know, maybe there was a phase where Baxter's are a little uvular happy, and they changed all the glove stops and uvulars. Uh, but uh, maybe now they've gotten just to the happy balance. So um, those are the simplex onset, uh, which we have gotten to by combining internal reconstruction and Shishun series, basically, uh, and then throwing out some things where we feel like we have enough ways of getting them that we don't need to pass them as, uh, as you know, still left over from the internal reconstruction of the Chinese. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it for this presentation. Any questions? Would it be so bad to have two coming from the series? No, I don't think anyone would die. <laughs> um, it, I, I think that's a that's a question of uh, aesthetics. You know, do do you, do you, are you bothered by two uh, homophonization series? I, I think I am a little bit. Yeah, I would be, but I'm more bothered by a really nice box. Yeah, but we don't. We've already decided we yeah, don't need like, it. Yeah, okay, but it sounds like we want that, right? Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we would we would need to pass through a phase where we had pharyngealized blood stuff. Maybe this is the mm. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. 
I, I can't say, oh, don't worry about it because it wasn't always for visualization, but but if the if the type A and the type B level stops don't merge, then uh, we would have needed pharyngealized and unpharyngealized level stops as in principle contrasted at a certain moment in Chinese history. And so that is a little bit disturbing. Now, I guess having two level five decisions is. Uh, or you know maybe the maybe the uvulars were I don't know. I know the future was really somewhere else. In the city. Oh yeah 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 maybe, yeah maybe maybe it was creaky vowels yeah 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 so let's say we had let's say we have uh, this you know versus this so. So this is this is what they actually reconstruct. No. Well, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> this is what they reconstruct. Yeah. So uh, we would then imagine that sort of once upon a time uh, in early old Chinese, we had this mysterious A uh, and a mysterious B. Okay. And then in let's say middle old Chinese, it had become this, yeah. So with the creaky vowel, uh, I think actually, so in Chinese linguistics, they you just write it with dominant, but I guess in IPA you write tilde, uh, and then this, yeah, and that would be okay, right? Uh, and then later you would add a ya here. Uh, and then here you would have it just like this, and this would be the late old Chinese slash um. So I think that's is that okay? I guess. Yeah, do we just need an onset because all our reflexes? No, we don't need phonemically, we don't need an onset. Uh, but I'm not sure that, like, there's still the phonetic question, right? Like. We we don't need a, a glottal onset in English, but we still have one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so we only allow it, allow it this ocean is only consonantal onsets, which is fine, I guess. Yeah, I mean just, so just to make that explicit, bathroom cigars reconstructions are always C V or you know or other stuff, right? Um, but but there's always at least one C there in their reconstructions. So another thing you could say, why not, is that uh, this one had a glottal stop and this one had an actual zero initial. Yeah. In type B, why not? Just say this one had an actual zero initial. That's you know a big one, not a little one. It's not a good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and then the glottal stop, you know, came back in later. That would also be fine with me. Right. I think some of these questions are just never going to get decided. Yes. On the diagnostical thing is foible lists two languages that are pharyngealized all the stuff. Oh, foible lists two languages with pharyngealized all the stuff. Which one? Never trust foible. That's what we call it. Says an Again? Says an I mean, I, I will say sometimes, like, like, um, uh, someone did once a, uh, a a review of the phonologies of Tibetan dialects, and then there were like two Tibetan dialects that had you know all sorts of everything crazy you could imagine, you know. Um, and uh, and it turns out, uh, and he said, "Oh, that's funny. That these two, you know, who knows?" And it turns out they were described by the same guy, right? So uh, I do think that when when you're only dealing with one language that has something, two languages that have something. Then, then, then the competence of the describer is something that. But uh, this is described by different people. Oh, okay. By a lot of. People. By a lot of different people. Well, good. Yeah. Then maybe. Uh, and there's also the um, pharyngealized glottal stop that is injected into language, so you can even have it as a sort of injected. So yeah. So then, then, so two languages have a pharyngealized, non-pharyngealized contrast on glottal stops, and two languages have. Ejective and non-ejective glottal stop. So we're not doing anything too perverse here in, in old Chinese. Yeah. Um, old Chinese would be right in the middle of those two languages. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
there's you know some there's some Latin poet somewhere who said you know anything that man is he's talking about doing evil yeah anything that man is capable of I am capable of but right? um, not necessarily like sporting events yeah uh, <laughs> and uh, and 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 I think maybe you know all Chinese feels that way like if you've got it I'll have it yeah.